Bible teaches us we're many parts, but one body. And when one part suffers, we all suffer. It's reminded those words today, yesterday, day before, as I reflected uh, in a very poignant way uh, on what happened tragically a few days ago to George Floyd uh, when my kids uh, grabbed me before I got out of the car coming home. Uh, they were in their pajamas, my 10-year-old, uh, with my wife's cell phone in hand. And somehow she had gotten onto TikTok and she was teared up. And she wanted to talk to me about this incident. And she had the video on this TikTok uh, of a police officer, a white police officer's knee uh, was at the neck of a young man who was desperate to breathe. And my daughter wanted to make sure I saw it. And she was trying to reflect 10 years old on what it meant. And here she was tearing up because she knew it was wrong. My son, eight years old, um, said, it's not just wrong, Dad. It's worse than wrong. He said, because bad people are supposed to be bad, but good people are supposed to be good. That's what makes this wrong. And no sooner did he do that, Dutch, my four-year-old, said, that's not right, Hunter. Police officers are good people, and he ran away. My daughter, Brooklyn, true story, by the way, my daughter, Brooklyn, just started to break down completely and ran away herself, said, I can't talk about all this. That's before I even walked into the house, four young kids trying to come to grips with what millions of Americans are trying to come to grips with. Not lost on me the privilege of that conversation. Not lost on me the privilege uh, of being governor, privilege of my background, privilege of, that my kids have in terms of their upbringing, the fact that they're white, the fact that unlike so many of their friends, so many of my closest friends, they don't have to raise their kids, I don't have to raise my kids, like my friend's kids are raised, and so many other millions of Americans' kids are raised to, you know, be in a car pulled over and we need to put their hands on the wheel, not to go out you know, with a hoodie on, not even curb to have that conversation at my home, but it's a conversation people are having all across this country for decades and decades and decades and decades, and it seemingly just doesn't end. When will it end? Here we are faced with that question yet again in deep and profound and emotional ways. And you start to appreciate, I've been in an elected office for decades now, that program passing, passing a law, you're not solving problems. You've got to change culture. You've got to change people's hearts and minds. It's not just laws on the books. We've got to fundamentally change who we are and recognize what we're capable of being. My wife and I, uh, after that incident, my wife, who's been a champion for the cause of equality in this state and in, in our nation, has written about it, directed a number of documentaries in this space, reminded me about the most foundational value which she thinks we need to express, and that is a recognition that we have a country that predominantly values power, dominance, and aggression over care, empathy, and collaboration that the predominant values we seem to be so attracted to as a nation, they're not serving us anymore. Power, dominance, and aggression over care, collaboration, and empathy. That stuck a chord with me. She's been saying it for years, but it strikes a chord at this moment in particular. And I think we would all be wise to consider that we have the capacity to be more caring to be more empathetic and to be more collaborative. And so this moment weighs heavily, I know, in the hearts of so many. There's deep anger, there's deep frustration, there's deep fear. And I, 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 I can attest to that, but only intellectually. My, one of my oldest friends, Derek Smith, he just sent me a picture of his son, who I knew since he was born, who just graduated from USC. That same kid, no less than four years ago, before he was graduating from a high school in Marin County, was pulled over by the local sheriff for no other reason than he was driving with his brother in a car. And he happened to be black. I remember Derek calling me in panic, 
lighting up my phone saying, need to talk to you, need to talk to you. What's, and I said, what's, what's the problem? He goes, I need you to call the sheriff right away. I can't take it anymore. And he starts tearing up. He said, I can't take it anymore. Because it's hardly his first experience or his kid's first experience. You know, just that wasn't caught on videotape. That was just a day in the life of uh, that one child and just another family. It happens every single day all across this country. We are so much better than that. And so I, I sit here deeply humbled, yeah, a bit emotional about this moment, uh, and deeply resolved to try to meet it head on and try to do more and do better. I, I couldn't be more proud of this state in that space. I talked to Dr. Shirley Weber today. She reminded me it was one year ago today that the California Assembly passed a landmark police use of force bill, AB 392. It was a year ago today that that passed the assembly. And how proud we all were of her and a coalition behind her that included law enforcement, that met that moment a year ago to work together across their differences in a collaborative spirit to recognize that we could do more and do better on the issue of training our police officers on implicit bias. And we could do more to provide the support and resources to truly train our police officers, not mandate certain things without supporting that change of behavior. We've made a lot of progress in this state, but my gosh, I was reminded again even this morning, incident down in San Diego, young man on a bench. Details of that are insignificant in the context of the totality and the magnitude of incidents of that kind that persists all across this country that are not part of the conversation on the nightly news. So our hearts go out to George Floyd and his family, of course. The entire community uh, that has been torn asunder, absolutely. But we have to be more resolved now than ever to do more and be better as human beings, as parents, as leaders, in our own right, and to model better behavior and soften the edges and make it the spirit of Dr. King and, and Kennedy to make more gentle the life of this world. Because it was King, just like Father Koss, that reminded all of us that we're all bound together by a web of mutuality, that we're all in this together. There's no leak on your side of our boat. And so in that spirit of the Commonwealth, in that spirit uh, that defines the best of our state, the best of our nation, and what we promote and what we promise, I hope we can all just practice a little bit more and lean in to this moment and make this moment more meaningful, not just in the spirit uh, of a young man whose life was taken away, but in the spirit of so many lives that are impacted every single day through structural racism and through our incapacity as a society to wake up to the realities that persist all across this state and all across this nation. Institutions, large and small, that fundamentally have to change, not least of which our criminal justice uh, institution. We can do more, we can do better, and so forgive me for being long-winded. There's no script here for being a little circuitous in my comments and perhaps commentary. Uh, but I uh, would be remiss if I just didn't express a, as a point of privilege a point of view, uh, again, humbly, uh, with a deep recognition that we have a lot of work to do. And I'm resolved to doing that work with each and every one of you and to bring people together at a time when we so desperately need people to focus on what we have in common. And my gosh is that overwhelming what we have in common. And so let us, let us commit ourselves to that in the spirit of this moment and of the spirit of this weekend where I pray that all of us that want to express ourselves do so thoughtfully and gently, uh, but forcefully in terms of expressing themselves uh, as they should and as they must uh, so that we collectively can not only hear your voice uh, but we can resolve to do something with the lesson that we learn if just we take the time to listen, finally listen, and do more and do better. So that's, uh, that's how I wanted to begin. 
Um, and forgive me, this sort of seems trivial. Uh, I want to now transition a little bit into uh, the work at hand uh, and connect a dot because the issues related to COVID-19, the issues related to health, issues related to our economy and our economic recovery uh, have obvious tenets that connect this moment so directly. The issues of race, uh, the issues of racism, the issues are a big part of the real work that we have in front of us as it relates to addressing the issues of public health, public safety, and economic growth and recovery. Uh, I'm going to set forth some slides that lay out some principles uh, that we are advancing in the state of California as we make modifications to our stay-at-home order. And then I will also present some slides which highlight what I mean as it relates to the disparities that persist that came into this crisis and persist through this crisis that also must be addressed uh, if we are to do justice uh, as a state and as a nation. Uh, so fundamentally, and again, forgive me for the transition, let me begin with a foundational principle, which is a core construct, and that is a reminder that localism is determinative. At the end of the day, whatever our ideals are as a state and as a nation, uh, those ideals will be manifest at the local level. We could set the tone, we can set the tenor, but at the end of the day, the actualization of those ideals must be made manifest at the local level. And it is a foundational predicate to which we advance as it relates to the issues of reopening the economy in the state of California and doing so in a thoughtful and judicious way, mindful of people's public health and mindful of data, the data that we will present here today. Most important thing that has occurred that allows me more confidence in our capacity to deliver in this state on our promise that we can safely and responsibly reopen the economy in the state of California is that our testing has substantially increased in this state. We went from roughly 2,000 tests a day to now over 50,000 tests every day. For last weekend, we had one day where we actually tested 67,000 individuals. You see here on this graph, 1.8 million people have been tested in the state of California. And what is so important, as we test exponentially more, 20, 30-fold more than we were just eight weeks ago, that when you are testing 20 to 34, 30-fold more individuals, you're going to have more positive tests. That's an inevitability. And that's why it's important, it's incumbent upon those reporting that, that we also report the positivity rate, which is the percentage of people that have, te have we tested uh, and the number of people as a percentage of that that have tested positive. We've been running a positivity rate over the last 14 days, and you can see the substantial increase in testing specifically over the last 14 days of roughly 4.1%. It's about 4.2% just over the last seven days. That's an encouraging number. That's a relatively stable number, and it's a much lower number than many states. Not every state, but many states. That's a number that's incredibly important when we talk about the issue of testing. I've seen the headlines uh, around total number of cases increasing, but equivalent consideration, at least a subtext of any headline, should also include some stability to the extent that's uh, reflected in our numbers in terms of the positivity rate. The issues, though, also need to be highlighted related to testing around race and ethnicity. Uh, this, again, connects the dot that I'm referring to. Uh, we talk about testing. It is incredibly important that we test our diverse communities in the state of California. As you all know, we have made real progress and made real commitment, and we are resolved to do more and do better, to reach out uh, throughout the diverse communities in the state of California, uh, not just uh, in inner cities in this state, but in rural parts of the state of California. You can see by the increased number of tests, you can see some trend lines that have legitimately and understandably become headlines all across this country. And that's the disparity in race and ethnicity in terms of the total number of positive cases and the total number of deaths in the state of California. This is manifest all across the United States of America. In some ways, our numbers are 
more in line with population and others, uh, we uh, are not immune to those disparities, again, that were brought into this crisis in the first place. You can see for the Latino community, 55 percent uh, of the total number of positive cases we've identified within the Latino community, uh, roughly 39 percent of the deaths, which is roughly in line with population on the death sides. Uh, Asian community, uh, relatively consistent on the death sides with population, but the black community, again, not surprisingly to the theme frame that connects the dots today. 5.3% uh, of the cases tested positive, a little below state population, but the number of deaths substantially, in percentage terms, substantially higher in the black community and the African-American community. And so it's a point to highlight and it's an incredibly important point about the structural challenges that we have as a state and a nation to address the issues uh, that we brought into this crisis and to substantially address to resolve these issues once and for all. And so, Dr. Galley, talk a little bit more about that. We're happy to answer more questions about why we think that's the case as it relates to comorbidities, what relates to issues of hypertension and uh, issues of diabetes and other related issues. Uh, issues is also related uh, to food deserts, all kinds of socioeconomic issues that we believe are part and parcel of this, as well as the nature of essential work in the state of California being overly represented by people of color in this state. All of those things lead to to an understanding, a more granular understanding of these numbers, but these are the systemic numbers that predate the incident, this tragic death of George Floyd, that fundamentally are being highlighted at this moment of protest, consternation, uh, hurt, uh, and protest across this country. So it relates to the issues uh, that also extend the narrative of consideration on reopening and have a component that also reaches into the frame of cultural competency. It's the issue of contact tracing. Uh, I made this point a few weeks ago that it's one thing to test. We also now, as we reopen our economy, must be able to contact individuals that have tested positive uh, and make sure that those they've come in contact with uh, that could test positive are contacted uh, in a very secure uh, and private way. The state of California came into this pandemic with roughly 3,000 tracers uh, that existed throughout the state of California, doing TB tracing, measles taste, uh, tracing, uh, hepatitis tracing, HIV and AIDS uh, tracing. We committed to developing a workforce in partnership with UCLA and UCSF. Uh, we announced that. We've been training a cohort of individuals. We announced a partnership with uh, Salesforce and Deloitte and Amazon to help us with the database, to collect that information, and to share that information across county lines up and down the state of California. It's important for folks to know, as we've increased our testing significantly, we also are on track to our goal of 10,000 tracers trained in a workforce by the end of next month. We've got cohorts uh, being trained every single week, hundreds and hundreds being trained every day uh, that will be part of this tracing core. And we have absolute confidence by July 1st uh, that that first phase commitment of 10,000 workers will be established. You can see on this slide that that 10,000 allows us to trace 3,600 new cases per day, uh, giving you a sense. Yesterday, we had about 2,189 new cases. Uh, so we have a threshold of confidence that once we have that tracing core up, that first phase, that we will meet the substantial needs of the counties that are reopening that have to commit as part of their attestation for containment plans, uh, their ability to trace appropriately, isolate and quarantine individuals so that we could keep uh, a lid on the, uh, the transmission of COVID-19. But the tracing has a component as well. We announced last week, and I just want to highlight this, the cultural competency in terms of our outreach to our diverse communities on tracing. Because it goes without saying right now, we're living in a world of anxiety uh, on many different levels, including anxiety for our Latino community and those in mixed status families uh, that are very fearful uh, around the rhetoric of deportation and the rhetoric, uh, the xenophobic rhetoric uh, that is so much part of our national 
discourse, uh, particularly over the last few years. Uh, and so it's incumbent uh, that we have a tracing core that looks like our communities and we have trusted messengers uh, that can make those phone calls and want folks to know, particularly in the Latino community, but more broadly, all across our diverse communities, uh, that when we call to reach out, these professionally trained individuals, they're doing so with not only your public health in mind, but your privacy in mind. It's foundational. And so we have a lot of PSAs that we've been putting out in this space, and I want folks to know we're making progress, we're fulfilling our commitment in this space as well, and we're doing it uh, with an eye on representing all of our diverse communities in the state of California. Issues of personal protective gear are foundational in terms of our effort to reopen our economy safely uh, and with an appropriate pacing. Uh, it is just a very important point of emphasis uh, that folks know that we have made huge gains. And when I mean huge, I mean in the tunes of tens of millions of units of new protective gear that are part of our state inventory that didn't exist even three weeks ago. We were able to get a very large contract uh, overseas that has allowed us to procure tens of millions uh, of procedure masks, surgical masks in the state of California in the recent weeks. Uh, our current state inventory, take a look at those numbers. You haven't seen numbers like this in the past. 85.9 million procedure masks that are currently part of our state inventory, 8 million uh, face shields, 5.6 million glove sets that are part of our state inventory. Uh, those numbers are good on one level because they're ample. On another level, I want to see those inventories decline because I want to get that inventory out all across the state, and that's exactly what we've been doing. Take a look at this. Our procedure mass distribution by sector, just as a proxy for our distribution, 44.3 uh, million procedure masks have just been delivered in the last 14 days. This slide just represents the last two weeks. You could see by sector, getting into the agricultural community, getting into hotel and lodging, getting into local government, uh, obviously committing ourselves to social service agencies and public safety, uh, looking uh, at the emergency sector, medical sector, but even beyond that, the retail sector. So we're getting those masks out there, which allows people to protect themselves, to protect others, and open more confidently within the framework of the guidelines uh, that we have Put out. And so real progress in this space, millions of masks coming in on a daily, weekly basis, millions more getting out as quickly as possible. But this is important for folks to understand that we understand foundationally that it's testing, tracing, and the capacity to distribute appropriate protective gear that is foundational. Accordingly, it's foundational we protect our most vulnerable populations. Remember, these were all part of the six indicators that we put out a few months ago that guide our decision-making. Data, indicators, science, health, that continue to drive our decision-making. We talked about one of those indicators being our capacity at the county level to protect vulnerable populations, nursing homes. Our surge capacity, you can see we've got hundreds of new beds for our surge capacity if we need them to isolate patients. Uh, we have 798 individuals that are trained in a new workforce that can go out like a strike team if we have workforce shortage or we have a walkout or we have a number of staff and cohort of staff that have been tested positive in a skilled nursing facility or another licensed facility, our ability to move quickly. We've got that core of infectious disease experts that have gone out, these strike teams and partnerships with the VA, partnerships with UNS NS Mercy, uh, partnerships with the National Guard, all focused uh, on protecting the most vulnerable, our seniors, particularly those in our nursing homes. Project Room Key, I'm so proud of this. Just eight weeks ago, can you imagine a state in just eight weeks uh, being able to get 9,397 rooms made available for formerly homeless individuals. By the way, 9,397, not the total number of people in those rooms. Those are the total number of occupied rooms in a portfolio that now has exceeded our goal of 15,000. So 60% of folks are already in those rooms, off the streets and out of shelters. Unprecedented in this state's history. I don't know another state. They claim to getting 10,000 rooms, almost 10,000. Remember, we put 1,000 trailers out, 1,305 in addition to the rooms available to cities and counties all across the state. What's really important about that occupancy rate is there is a subtext on that. 78% of the rooms that were set aside for asymptomatic uh, uh, clients and those that needed the support of isolation, 
we have occupied, close to 80%. Uh, those that have tested positive, we have a larger cohort of rooms that are set aside that are not yet occupied. And in some respects, that's a good thing because the total number of positivity cases out uh, in uh, the homeless sector uh, have not been as acute uh, as some of the earlier projections. But we're not out of the woods. We're not naive that we're getting all the tests out there by any stretch. I'm not naive about the criticism of needing to do more and better. I acknowledge that. We will, will do more and do better. But I am so proud of a first-in-the-nation program uh, where we can lay claim uh, to getting thousands and thousands and thousands uh, of people off the streets in just a few weeks. And I want to just compliment our team uh, for incredible work in that space. 50,000 rooms. Remember, we made a commitment. We have to have appropriate hospital surge capacity. We decompressed that hospital system. Incredible partnerships with 416 of our hospitals up and down the state of California, working with the Hospital Association, uh, working with small, large hospitals uh, and systems. And they were able to identify a surge capacity of 50,000 rooms. That's check off that exists, our capacity, our understanding of how to utilize that inventory is also foundational, our ability to reopen this economy and do so in a safe, judicious, and phased-in approach. Again, one of our leading and critical indicators. And that's on top of the stabilization numbers that now we want to, well, transition to and talk about briefly before I bring up Dr. Galley. Uh, we have seen trend lines for weeks and weeks and weeks, well beyond just 14 days, where hospitalization uh, rates have remained fairly static, actually declined modestly. ICU uh, bed utilization has been fairly static over the course, declined in the last 24 hours, 1.3 percent, hospitalizations by 2.3 percent. The point, though, is that line over the course of many, many weeks is stable. And within that frame of stability, again, gives us confidence that counties can do decide on their own pace what's best for them in terms of their reopening plans. Uh, again, these are aggregate numbers. Counties don't live in the aggregate, and I won't talk about that in a minute, but they are encouraging signs nonetheless in terms of the work that's been done in this state uh, to address the spread uh, and suppress the transmission of this virus. We put out sectoral guidance also have supported the regional attestations. The sectoral guidance have included over 17 sectors of our economy uh, that can reopen. And we expressed in that guidance how we can safely reopen the economy. We didn't say when. We said how. The when question is determined by local health officials. The state puts out the guidelines by sector on how to safely reopen. It's the counties working with their health director that can determine the pace of when. The state is not dictating, is not mandating those dates. It puts out the sectoral guidance and allows for a deliberative process to be put into place by counties. And that's why you see variation up and down the state of California. Some counties, not all, in the Bay Area is an example, that are moving a little slower. Other counties that are moving a little bit faster. It's exactly the system we designed over the course of many, many weeks. And it's exactly what we encourage. What works in Lassen may not work in other parts of the state. What works in Kern may not even work nearby in Tulare County. Each county has its own unique conditions. And localism, again, is the foundational principle to which we determine when to attest to the local plans based upon local leadership guiding the decision of when to reopen. Again, we put out the how. Counties decide when. So here's where we are. In Here's the long-winded point I wanted to get to today uh, before I turn it over to Dr. Galley, is that a big part of the phase that we're in in this state, now as we're moving into phase three, we are not ready for phase four. I'll just briefly remind you, phase four is concerts, big outdoor stadiums and sporting events, festivals, and large conventions. We're simply not there. There's no sectoral guidance that's been given. There's no authority for local health officials to move in 
to that phase. But into phase three, on their own pace, we are allowing local decision making to go into effect. But it's conditioned on plans that have to be attested to uh, by local county electeds and local health officials and through a process of engagement with the state of California, our Department of Public Health. We put those plans on our website, covid19.ca.gov, and we actively monitor those plans. And when there are issues, we target support and engagement. Let me be specific about this and highlight just a few examples. Imperial County. We have been working with Imperial County for the last few weeks. They saw a big increase in hospitalizations. They had some cross-border issues that needed to be addressed. We brought out our DMAP teams. We brought out our National Guard. Uh, we brought in HHS officials, not just from the state of California, but in partnership with the federal government. We brought resources to bear, including field medical stations, so that we can decompress, reduce the total population in their hospital system, and get them into these temporary facilities, including the addition of more ventilators. By the way, we have roughly 11,000 ventilators within our system right now that are currently available to be targeted if there's flare-ups or needs across the state of California. So we're doing targeted engagement. We did it in Kern County recently around skilled nursing facilities. We did it in Tulare County with OSHA and not just our health officials uh, related uh, to some issues in meat packing facilities. That target engagement is part of a very deliberative process of engagement uh, based upon flare-ups, based upon hotspots, placed upon areas that we are monitoring in real time with constant collaborative spirit and engagement uh, with local officials. And that's why I just want to remind everybody, as I now transition, that if we see through the process of target engagement numbers that persist and things that get out of control, uh, we will direct the local health officials to put a dimmer switch back on and begin to toggle back, put the brakes on in terms of the modifications and the stay-at-home orders. You saw exactly this up in Lassen County. To Lassen County's health director's credit, they saw a little bit of spike, uh, relative numbers, relatively few, but for Lassen, a relatively large number, considering the total population. They made some targeted adjustments. They did more testing, they did tracing, uh, and they began the process of making modifications back and forth. This is part of the process uh, that we're in. And so the reinstitution of interventions is that third key of countering monitoring uh, that is foundational. But again, all of this, all of this is done with local public health officer using data to decide what's appropriate for them. We are not mandating a pace for opening. San Francisco just announced their mayor that on June 15th, in two weeks, they will move forward. They are afforded the opportunity to go sooner. They, because of local conditions, chose to go a little bit later. We again encourage that. San Mateo wanted to move a little faster than other parts of the Bay Area. Marin than other parts of the Bay Area. Again, local public health officers using data will decide the appropriate timing uh, for these openings. And we, again, think that is a foundational principle that you will hear over and over again that is reinforced in three simple words. Localism is determinative. So with that, I'm determined now, forgive the long-windedness of the presentation, to turn this over uh, to our public health czar, uh, head of HSS in the state of California, to talk a little bit more uh, about our efforts in the state, his partnerships with counties, the differentiation within counties, and our individual and collective approach to addressing the unique characteristics and needs of counties, large and small, up and down the state of California. I'll just make one final point. This state's population, I've said it on many occasions, is larger than 21 states. Remember, there's only 50 states. 21 states in the United States of America combined. That's how large California. If you put the map of California and overlaid it on the Northeast Corridor of the United States, you'd see how many states, in terms of the geographic size and population size, uh, that state map would consume. It's a point of making that all of our effort has to be done with local considerations, local construct, localism 
fundamentally in mind. And so Dr. Galley will speak to that as well here in a moment. Uh, but if you wish to tune out or you've already turned off, I would encourage you just to go to the covid19.ca.gov website, covid19.ca.gov website. You see up there under monitor because on that website, uh, we have all of the information I presented today and all of the 48 county self-attestations that have been put up in terms of local containment plans uh, around COVID-19 that you can monitor yourself if you're a member of the community or for your own interest, monitor on behalf of the larger community, the state of California. Doctor. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor. Uh, I'm just going to briefly go over a little bit about what the governor has been sharing about how local conditions really are going to drive some of the decisions and just walk you through four different counties and their case data. Um, I'm going to start in the southern part of our state uh, at Imperial County. Uh, Border County shares with Mexico. Uh, the governor already just spoke about how in that county we have been for weeks monitoring cases, watching their hospital numbers, in addition to the many important things the governor mentioned, allowing the state uh, in a very targeted way, working with the local partners there, the hospitals, two big hospitals, uh, moving over 200, nearly 200 patients out of the county into surrounding county hospitals to make sure that those facilities don't get overwhelmed, bringing in addition testing sites to allow us to stay on top of disease transmission and to ensure that that contact tracing uh, infrastructure can be put into place. One of the counties, one of the first counties in the state getting on our Accenture Salesforce uh, platform to be able to track where uh, cases are showing up and making sure that we uh, can contact those who are close contacts. And you see from this graph that we've seen some ups and downs and Imperial County's data looks only like Imperial County's data. Nearby counties look very different. Going to go a little bit uh, further north to Los Angeles County, my home county where uh, even though the case numbers are much higher because of the number of people there, their enormous increase in testing within Los Angeles County is identifying areas of the county that need focus. We've been talking about the skilled nursing facilities and the focus in Los Angeles County, how there are many cases, deaths in those facilities, that we are working hard with the county to ensure that we get that testing into those sites and that we look at the essential workers and that healthcare workforce in Los Angeles County, in those skilled nursing facilities, and the impact on brown and black communities throughout that county, where those workers go home and potentially uh, transmit COVID-19 to family members, those with underlying chronic conditions, those who might be vulnerable in other ways. And so working hard with this county to, to make sure that uh, as that data line goes up, as you see it has over the last few days, that we work with them to understand where those cases are, ensure that the hospital capacity is strong enough to meet the need for those people and those individuals in those communities. Let's go a little further north to Alameda County, where uh, we see one of the Bay Area counties that together those counties have um, uh, moved forward with their different orders and their different pace, the, not just the when, but the how, to reopen and bring back sectors. And you see that Alameda has a very different looking case graph, that they've had peaks and valleys as well, and that our constant communication with those public health leaders and local officials in Alameda looking at both skilled nursing facilities, certain communities, uh, whether it's uh, uh, East Oakland or other parts of Alameda County, where we know there are existing health disparities and making sure that testing is targeted there, um, ensuring that we're not just seeing uh, uh, rising cases based on just testing, but ensuring that those hospitals are able to meet the need for those patients who might need care. Then I'm going to end with just a quick discussion about Lawson County. Uh, we see that they had zero cases up until just days ago. 
the health officer and the whole community attested, ready to move in through stage two and now stage three. And earlier in this week, we learned from them in close contact and dialogue that they were going to slow down, that they discovered two cases, that they did uh, testing, found three others for a total of five, that they were able to uh, contact and find close contacts up to 70 people that they worked to test and then quarantine safely, understood where those transmission points might have been. And um, as they brought that situation under control, made sure that they had the capacity to protect their community, they've made the decision to continue moving forward and bring back parts of their economy and communities. So I've basically taken you through a quick south to north of our um, state, showing you that each county has a little bit of a different story. The distance between Imperial to Lassen is about that from Vermont to Vir Virginia. And nobody would expect Vermont and Virginia to behave the same. They aren't. They're in fact working hard to make sure their own communities and counties and uh, populations are protected in the unique ways for Vermont and Virginia. And so as the governor has said, we have uh, presented aggregate data over weeks we have continued to have local county level data. We appreciate the ongoing partnership with local health officers, those, you know, the tremendous teams that they have at the local level working hard to not only track this data, but make those difficult decisions for their own communities, working with the elected officials and other county and city and community leaders to set that pace. And the state is uh, in that partnership position to monitor the data, have strong and regular conversations with the counties to make sure that we're protecting and supporting them to make these decisions. And when we need to, as in the case of Imperial, bring in additional resources and uh, to bring the collection of California's strength together to help um, put out small fires, small surges in cases to make sure that California moves safely together while recognizing those unique characteristics of each of our counties and communities. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Galley. And, and uh, again, uh, we thought it was important to update on these, these regional variations. Again, an expression uh, of reinforcing a paradigm uh, that needs to be communicated and cannot be repeated enough, uh, that state of California, as we put out guidelines, we are not dictating when counties move on those guidelines. That will be determined on the basis of working with local health officials, local elected officials, with attestations that require certain conditions to be met before they can move in that direction. 48 counties out of our 58 have substantially moved uh, through the process of getting the attestations uh, and have moved forward, but not all of them wish to do so at this time. And that's exactly what we want to see. Local decision-making based on local conditions at a pace that's appropriate to meet local needs. Strong oversight, strong monitoring, targeted intervention, and capacity building and the ability to put that dimmer switch on, the brakes on, and pull back these orders on the basis of the spread of the virus. But the bottom line, and I think it is foundational in this state, is that because of your extraordinary work, 40 million of you, we bought time. We bent this curve. In fact, we didn't bend it. We never allowed that curve to take off like other parts of this country. We've had stability for weeks and weeks and weeks. And not only did we buy time, we invested an unprecedented amount of resources, human resources and physical resources, to build capacity to meet the needs of those entering into this new phase if indeed we see an increase in cases and an increase of hospitalization and needs uh, for people uh, to get the kind of support they deserve in an ICU or elsewhere. 
And so that's the message we're trying to communicate today, uh, highlighted not only in this presentation, uh, but always highlighted on that covid19.ca.gov website. Cannot encourage you more. Take a look at it. Go county by county. Get a sense of what your county is doing, what your county may not be doing. Uh, and just know that that pace now is 100 percent going to be determined on the basis of your local health director in partnership, local county officials. We'll be putting out some new guidelines next week. Substantially now we're in the frame for the next few weeks uh, of a phase three approach on local decision timeline. So that's the presentation today. Of course, happy to take any questions. Adam Beam, Associated Press. Hello, Governor. Uh, two questions. One, are, are you confident that the masks from BYD will be certified by the May 31st deadline? And two, what is the state doing to prepare for uh, protest uh, tonight and this weekend over the death of George Floyd? Well, we, we, we've received over 50 million masks from the BYD contract, received them earlier than we had anticipated. Uh, and those masks have been distributed along the lines that I just showed you over the last 14 days. So they were certified. Those surgical masks are in not our possession any longer. They're out uh, distributed throughout sectors of the economy. You're referring to the N95 masks that were part of that contract. They're going through a NIOS process, uh, and we're very, very close uh, to the determination by the federal government. We have not spent one penny on anything we haven't received. If they do not get the certification that's required in the contract, we won't be out a dollar and we'll find other ways of procuring those masks. But we cannot, I cannot say this enough, how pleased we are by the tens of millions of masks that we have received that have allowed us to send those masks to our healthcare workers, our frontline workers, our farm workers, and to our school system. If we're gonna reopen the economy, everybody doesn't need an N95 masks, but they do need appropriate face coverings. And I wanna remind folks, face coverings are appropriate. Face coverings are almost, well, they're foundational. If you're going to come into contact with people, if you can't physically distance six feet away from other people, it is incumbent upon you not only protect yourself, but to protect others uh, by putting a face covering on. And I want to encourage people uh, to do just that. And of course, guidelines that we put out uh, in the local decision about when they want to uh, allow those guidelines to go in effect. So many of the guidelines require face masks of certain businesses and certain customer engagements. And that's why, again, we're very pleased with the pace uh, of the procurement uh, under that contract. As it relates to broader issues, for days now we've been working. I happen to be here at the State Operations Center uh, where we have the diversity of the state, federal, local, and regional family. Uh, so they're all here in task forces, large and small, not just for COVID-19. This is where we prepare for wildfire season. This is where we have an all hazards approach dealing with prospects of earthquakes. That work is happening literally behind me as we speak, including constant and never engagement with community leaders, faith-based leaders, uh, leaders of all stripes, all up and down the state of California uh, as it relates to uh, planning for any contingency, including along the lines that you suggest. Doug Sovereign, KCBS Radio. Hi, Governor. Uh, so much to ask you about today, but um, President Trump has tweeted and spoken repeatedly the last couple of days, highly critical, often mischaracterizing your plan to mail ballots to all registered voters. Uh, Twitter took the unprecedented step of tagging his tweets with a fact check link, and today they flagged a tweet about the George Floyd protests for glorifying violence. How do you respond to the president's continued attacks on you and this election process? And should these California companies, Twitter, Facebook, uh, be in the business of fact checking what public officials post on their platforms? I say this with deep respect. I think this is a sideshow. Uh, I think, in so many respects, this has been a diversion tactic, much more than anything else. That's my humble opinion. Good people can disagree. But I've been doing this a while. Uh, I respond. As I've responded, the good news is I haven't had to respond. You're right. Uh, the president's been fact-checked about that tweet that initiated that, which was a tweet against me in the state of California. Uh, you made a point that the president unfortunately didn't make about registered voters versus all uh, living people, regardless of how they arrived in the state of California, which was the tweet that was fact-checked. But beyond that, uh, I see this as a sideshow 
Uh, and my essential frame of focus is dealing with the issue of trying to unite this country, not along the lines of Democrats or Republicans in political terms, but across the spectrum. Uh, and at this fundamental moment in our history, state, nation, the world, collectively, we're trying to build, uh, that's the spirit to which I will engage in conversation and debate with and about the president, with and about uh, issues uh, that appear on the nightly news, uh, but none that are more important and pressing than the issue of race relations in this country and addressing the public health uh, of the entire uh, diverse population in the state of California and the rest of the nation. Bill Willen, LA Times. Uh, hi, Governor. How are you doing? Um, today, your administration approved a variance for Los Angeles County. And uh, as you know, L L.A. County has been the epicenter of the pandemic in the state. And with 10 million people living there, even a small uh, spike in cases will affect a lot of people. Uh, how do you justify granting the variance to L.A. County? Well, we um, and secondly, what exact data or conditions on the ground do you or, the, or your administration have to see in counties to move in and reimpose restrictions? Well, that's exactly what we set out uh, in the the dialogue today and what we put up on our websites, the targeted examples that Dr. Galley referenced, those four counties, the specific work we've been doing with Tulare uh, and with Kern County on SNFs and meatpacking facilities, what's happened down in Imperial County, what's happening last, and are perfect examples of the kinds of areas of engagement, targeted enforcement, and frame of partnership that we have with local health directors. Let me just clarify something. The local health director made the decision in L.A. today. The state of California did not. They put out the attestation. They put out the self-certification that certain criteria and conditions, utilizing the technical assistance of the state of California and the guidelines that we put up. Again, I cannot repeat it enough, and please, it's important that it be repeated, uh, not just by me, but as a point of foundational reference in terms of the policies of the state of California. The guidelines do not dictate when, they dictate how. The determination of when is done by local county health directors in collaboration with local elected officials. So that question is foundationally a question for local health directors and local county officials. Our guidelines simply say, this is how we believe you can do it safely and thoughtfully with your eyes wide open, and all we ask of you in the attestation, we don't approve it. We just certify it meets the foundational conditions we put out, which you and others have written about on many, many occasions, that we then post that on our website. And when we post it on the website, that affords the opportunity for localism to go into effect and the application and implementation of their self-certification moving forward. Question, Dustin Gardner, as of the Chronicle. Thank you, Governor. Um, I was curious if you had any update in terms of when you might release guidelines for school reopenings. And then also, we've heard some from a number of school officials um, and labor groups that they're concerned they can't reopen and follow those guidelines given the, the, the cuts that are, are, are in your May revise. Yeah. Uh, look, I respect that. These are historic moments. Uh, the budget uh, has presented itself in historic terms, a $54.3 billion shortfall. Just uh, 90, 100 days ago, we were projecting uh, well north of $6 billion surplus. I'm confident it would have been closer to $10 billion. Forgive me. Uh, that's not conjecture. I, I can base that on the foundation of a number of factors that uh, predated COVID-19. Uh, so this is simply without precedent. Uh, and it's not unique to the state of California. Uh, these cuts of this magnitude are being felt all across this country. Uh, you saw Governor Murphy, just as an example today in New Jersey, uh, announce uh, a rather remarkable uh, estimate of the number of people he believes the state will be compelled to lay off, and hundreds of thousands just in his state because of this pandemic, this global pandemic, as it's manifested in this country in states large and small, including uh, the state of New Jersey. Uh, so uh, we are working with our partners uh, to do two things. To answer your first part of your question, which is uh, 
working to come up with appropriate guidelines. We have some drafts that are going back and forth. They're not finalized. Uh, one was uh, reported today, but it's in draft form. Uh, and we'll be working uh, very closely to uh, work through uh, some final edits. And once we're prepared, we'll put those out. Foundational in that is appropriate level protective gear, because it's one thing to talk about schools and talk about our children as it's foundationally understood. But we also have to have an equipment conversation about caring for our caregivers. And what I mean by that is our teachers, but our custodial staff, our, our principals, uh, our PE, teachers, uh, folks in the cafeteria, our janitorial staff, our bus drivers, uh, so many others, uh, so many factors that maintenance crew that we need also to uh, uh, serve and protect. And so uh, we are working across the spectrum, of those stakeholders, uh, to advance that cause. And obviously this budget uh, is a cause that unites us in terms of our request and closing to the federal government. Again, it's not charity. Uh, it is a federal effort that Speaker Nancy Pelosi has advanced uh, with conviction and courage where she got her colleagues uh, and she got one co-equal uh, branch within uh, the Congress, the House of Representatives, uh, to pass uh, a HEROES Act, understanding a foundational principle that, that is HEROES that will be impacted disproportionately by budget cuts, not just at the state level, but the local and county levels. Those HEROES are those teachers. Those heroes are our nurses and doctors. Those heroes are our firefighters uh, and uh, those sheriffs, deputies, as well as police officers uh, that are doing so much every single day to protect public safety uh, and uh, to meet this moment and protect public health. And so we continue to work across the political lines, Republican governors, Governor Hogan, Democratic governors, Governor Murphy, many others united in the cause of getting support from the federal government at this historic moment where unemployment has now increased just shy of Depression-era numbers, well on our way to north of 20 percent across the United States, 25-plus percent uh, in many different states, impacting our budgets in unprecedented ways. So all of these things we're working through in real time, eyes wide open. Uh, sober to the realities, sober to the challenges, as well uh, as uh, the impact uh, this will have on our ability to reopen our economy uh, and get people moving again. So thank you all for the opportunity and privilege of your time. Thank you, Dr. Galley and his team for all their outstanding work in partnership and collaboration with local health officials. I'll remind you, local health officials are the tip of the spear as it relates to the when question. The how question uh, is framed in the guidance that this state puts out, but the pacing, the application of the efforts to move forward into these new phases is in the hands of local health directors. They have the right and the responsibility to make determinations based on local conditions in partnership uh, with their local elected officials. We respect that right. We honor it. Some will go slowly. Some will go a little bit more quickly, but no one will go forward to concerts. No one will be allowed to move forward with large venues uh, like conventions and festivals uh, until we are in a much better position than we are today. No one as well, in closing, is naive about the reality of reopening our economy and the expectation that as more and more people mix and are not practicing physical distancing, are not wearing face coverings, that the likelihood that we see a larger spread of this disease uh, presents itself. That likelihood is very real, and we know that. And that's why in the presentation today, we were crystal clear on our planning around that expectation and our capacity that has never been more robust to address those issues in real time in a targeted way and in the aggregate as a state uh, that has worked for months to procure more PPE, to get more testing, to hire more tracers, to train more tracers, to find more alternative care sites, and to work in the spirit of collaboration and cooperation across political lines and geographic lines to work with our county leaders, work with our health directors, uh, to build a framework uh, so that we can go forward together responsibly as a state that's larger, again, than all but five econ four economies in the world and is as large as 21 states' populations combined. Take care, everybody. Have a good, safe, 
weekend. And again, our hearts go out uh, to communities torn asunder uh, by just this another act, senseless uh, violence against a member of our community in public. Uh, and we just again express our deep condolences uh, to George Floyd and his family. Thank you, everybody.